Okay, this next section of the Accounting 101, we are going to look at accounts receivables and anything that we may earn some money on that we aren't necessarily getting paid right away. And we're gonna look at a few things. The first one being bad debt. So those who we have sold credit to or sold um, items to and sold it to them on credit. What if they never pay us? How do we account for that? Or how do we estimate who isn't going to pay us? So we're gonna look at that uh, first. And then second, we're gonna look at uh, interest receivables, earning interest on a loan that we may have made, either us doing a service and then getting paid a year in advance or a year uh, later, or perhaps just loaning money and earning interest that way and how we calculate that and how we record it at year end to show that we have actually earned some money. So we're going to do some adjusting entries at the year end when we look at the uh, interest. So let's get into the uh, account receivable with bad debt. <clears throat> so a, a new expense that we're going to have on our T accounts is a bad debt expense. So it's going to go with all the other expenses. It's basically, go basically going to offset some of the revenue that we recorded. Because let's say we recorded, just to make easy numbers, uh, 10000 in revenue for the year. But if we are, if our if some of our customers don't pay us, let's say 500 of that 10000 then we need to show that not all 10,000 is coming our way as, as, uh, as, as income. So we're still gonna record the whole 10,000 because we don't know it at the time that they're not gonna pay us. But then later on, we have to expense out that $500 because out of the 10,000, we never got it or never will get it. Okay, so there's gonna be some different methods that we can use to record um, bad debt. The first one is, this is more of the cash basis. So this is for small companies who don't really need to follow GAAP, who can just um, kind of look at their books and know who's not going to pay them and go ahead and make a, um, a good faith judgment. That's called the direct write-off method. So the direct write-off method basically just says, I know that this customer right here won't pay me and I haven't made any um, estimates before that. I just take it right off when I think it's not going to be paid. And what we do is we put it right into bad debt expense. And so that would transfer over to the income statement and then take it right off the customer's bill. It's as easy as that. If they ever do it in return pay us, as we'll see in some of the homework problems later on in uh, our segment two, when we get into connect, all we need to do is just reverse this entry. Just flip it. That's all you do is just flip it if they end up to pay us later on. And then simply do another entry to show that they've paid on at least some of their bill, if not all of it. So we would flip it and then we would, um, after we flipped it, we would have debited cash and credited the AR again. So eventually we are getting rid of the AR, hopefully slowly, if not all of it, if they end up paying us later on after we've already taken the bad debt expense. So that's the first method. The, uh, for small businesses, then they're okay to use that. Now, if you're a big business and you need to follow GAAP, you're gonna, um, you're gonna need to not necessarily rely on just what you think, what you feel, because some people may not be as honest, perhaps. They may just leave a customer's account on there for a long time. And what that's gonna do, if you leave a customer's account, let's say a customer owes you $10,000 and they haven't paid it for 20 years. So you know you're not gonna get it. But what that does, as you've seen in your prior um, ratios that we've done, that keeps your current assets up. That keeps that 10,000 on there and it makes it look like to any um, investors or anybody looking at your books that that money is gonna be coming in soon when you know full well it's not going to. So you're kind of trying to cheat and get around the, the, um, the issue and that's obviously not the way to go. So with the uh, allowance method, using uh, what GAP says to do, we make estimates. You estimate who's not gonna pay you even though you don't know for sure who isn't. So you, we create a new account. This new account is called Allowance for Doubtful Accounts. And think of it just very, just like a, uh, con um, the accumulated depreciation account for equipment. So with the equipment, and then you have right next to it the accumulated depreciation that acts as this 
it, it reduces the value of the equipment after you've depreciated it. It's a, it's a contra account. Same with the allowance for doubtful accounts. You can have an allowance for that. You can have an AR balance of 10 grand and then over here an allowance for doubtful accounts that says uh, probably out of that 10, 500 isn't going to be collectible. I don't know who, but when I combine those two together, the 10 and then the five contra together, they have a net of 9,500. That's what I think I'm still going to collect, not the full 10. Now, one way to uh, calculate and determine uh, how much is not going to be paid to us, we can use the easier of the next two methods, the easier but perhaps the less accurate. Um, and I'll tell you and I'll just kind of explain why. So the first way we can estimate is doing a percentage of sales, which is very straightforward. You simply uh, determine how much sales you have on account for that year. Say it's 10 grand. And then if, if 1% isn't going to be collectible for that, uh, for that time period, so 1% of 10,000 is $100, we would simply debit our bad debt expense for 100 and credit our allowance for doubtful accounts. Now remember that allowance, it's a contra account. We're not crediting right into the customer here. We don't know which customer is not going to pay us. We just think somebody's not going to pay us. And so we're creating that temporary account for the allowance to say, I think somebody's not going to pay us. Once we determine who it is, then we can take it further and we can take it off of their books directly at that point. And so we'll see how that works here in, in our example. <clears throat> um, notice here that the amount recorded that you record as your debit and credit that you got from your percent of sales has no bearing on the current allowance for doubtful account balance. So last month, let's say I had $100 in there. And then this month, I had 20,000 in sales at, in 1% uncollectible. So I would add another 200. It doesn't matter that I already have 100 in here. I'm gonna tack on another 200. That's, that's the, the whole thing. And that's pretty much all there is to percent of sales. So here's my uh, little example. If the company decides 1% of its sales will be uncollectible, the allowance for doubtful accounts, we already have $400 in there from previous months that we've built up. And then we have current sales of 50,000. So all we're going to do is take 1% of the 50, ignore this for right now, it's not needed. Um, and then say $500 debit bad debt expense, 500 of this probably won't come in and put it into our allowance for doubtful accounts. So then if I look at the allowance for doubtful accounts, it now has an updated balance of $900 because we already had a $400 credit balance. Remember, uh, allowances are opposite, so they have a credit balance in the assets. And we just put in another 500, uh, another credit for 500 in the allowance for doubtful accounts. So now I have 900 that I expect won't come in total. Now, they're a little bit more complicated, but I also think, in my personal opinion, a little bit more accurate is the aging of accounts receivable method. And what this does is you have, and you've probably seen this on doctor bills or some other bills that you may have gotten, it'll, it'll show you where your balance is in, down below, how late it is. It'll say not late, or it'll say one to 30 days late, 31 to 60 days late. So what the company's gonna do is they're gonna find where you're at on that, on that progression, and then they're gonna uh, assign a percentage that says people in that 31 to 60 days late, they are, and then they'll put in a percentage, say 10%, um, there's 10% chance they're not gonna pay. So then they're gonna add up everybody's uh, uh, balance in that 31 to 60 days late and then take 10% of that. And that's how much is gonna be put into the uh, allowance for doubtful accounts just for that category. And then they're gonna do the same for each of those categories. And they're gonna have a different percentage for each of those categories because those who aren't late are probably more likely that they're going to pay. Those who are maybe 90 days late, there's a lot better chance that they are not going to pay. So maybe their percentage is up to 25 percent. Okay, so again, the company determines the percentage, what they feel their customers aren't going to pay, 
for each of those individual segments, they add them all up, and then when they add them all up, the total, that is the new allowance for doubtful account balance. It's not the journal entry like it was just above for the uh, percentage of sales. Once I got the percentage of sales, that was the journal entry. This one's not the case. What we're doing here is simply figuring out what should be my final balance of the allowance for doubtful accounts. Up here, I got the journal entry. This was the final balance. Now for this aging of accounts receivable, what I'm doing is in a sense, I'm finding this number and then I have to determine what is the journal entry to get me to there. So I knew I started with 400. I know the ending should be 900. So my journal entry has to be five to get me 400 plus something equals nine. So that's what we're gonna do down here. Once we have figured up all of the items and added them up and found the new balance, we're gonna take the beginning balance plus the unknown X and it's gonna equal that new ending balance that I just calculated. All right, so let's do this example. <laughs> I tell us that our AR, we have $40,000 in our AR. Notice nowhere on here did I tell us how much in sales we had. We, didn't, we don't need to know that. All I need to look at is my AR balances. And then I tell us we have an opening for allowance for doubtful accounts of 3,000. So I have 40,000 debited in the AR, credit 3,000 to my allowance for doubtful accounts. So together, I'm expecting to collect $37,000 when you combine these two. Now this is our, this is all of these amounts here, if you add them all up, they equal 40 grand. This is the 40 grand broken down into different segments of how late our customers are. These guys aren't late at all. And out of those guys, we think eh, only 2% of them will continue to move down the progression and not pay us. Out of these guys, most a lot of people have started to pay us off, but there's still 5,000 in the 30 day, one to 30 days late. And we think 5% of those will continue to move down and then not pay us. 20% for the next, and then for our last group here, there's kind of a 50-50 chance they may not pay us, so that's not good. So we put that, uh, we say 50% of that 8,000. We'll get to this second, we'll come back to this in a second, but let's first off start calculating this. So what I've done here is I've taken, okay, the 25,000 at 2%. That means I suspect out of that big dollar amount there, only 500, so not too much, will not be collected in total. 250 for this, Four and then 4,000 when you've done them, when you've calculated all the way through. When you add all of these up, I forget that my new allowance for doubtful account should be 5150. Remember, I started at 3,000. So my opening credit is 3,000, and then my ending balance needs to be 5150. So what was the journal entry in between to get me to 5150? That's how the allowance for doubtful accounts is a little bit more hard, is a little bit tougher because you got to remember that second step in there. But I also think it makes it a little bit more um, useful in that you're calculating not just putting all the sales into one group, you're pulling each of the items out and then giving them different percentages of how likely they are to pay or not pay. So now we're ready to do the journal entry. I've given us just kind of a little allowance for doubtful account. This is my, this is the best I can do in T accounts here in Word. I've got my AR T account over here, a debit balance for 40 grand, and then the contra account. I have my opening at three, and then something happened that we're gonna have to fill in now. And when we're all said and done, what we just calculated, the 5150, that needs to be my new ending balance. So I need to figure up the journal entry. And when I do that, if I just do some simple math, 5150 less the 3000 says, well, we need to add in 2150 to make this equation work. So I'm gonna debit my bad debt expense for 2150 and credit the allowance for doubtful accounts for 2150. So hopefully you can see how now this is different 
than the percent of sales. The percent of sales, simply what you calculated, that was your journal entry. The 1% of 50,000, the 500 bucks, that's your journal entry. Then you just figured up your final total. Down here, we figured up the final total, and then we had to go back and figure what the journal entry had to be to get to that total. Now, the last piece I said we'd come back to is this one. So we have 5150 that we think won't become, won't be coming in. We finally get a letter from Marty's attorney and Marty went bankrupt and he has a balance due of $800. So out of that 5150 that we have deemed estimate uncollectible, well now 800, 800 of it has proven true. I don't want to put that 800 as more bad debt because I've already put that 800 as bad debt and I just didn't know it. That 800 is somewhere in here. And I temporarily said, instead of crediting the AR account for Marty, because I didn't know, I put it into this temporary account. Now that I know it's Marty specifically, I can take it out of the unknown contra account, the estimate, and say, okay, it's no longer an estimate. I can take it right out of Marty's account. And his, his AR is now zero, because I don't expect it to come in. And then my allowance for doubtful accounts has kind of went back down a little bit. It's no longer 5150 because I just took off $800 because I have 800 less that I now um, are estimating because I, I now know where 800 is coming from. Okay, so that's a uh, look at um, bad debt expense looking at uh, using our AR account. The last segment here, and this one is a, a little quicker segment, we're gonna look at how we earn and then collect interest on notes. So the difference between an account receivable and a note receivable, the biggest difference is an account receivable, you don't collect interest. It's something that is usually every month, every two months that and you expect it to come due. Maybe there may or may not be signatures involved. It may just be a revolving credit. With a note receivable, it's a little more formalized. They're usually bigger dollar amounts and they're over a longer span. And then with that, when there's a note, the notes typically involve interest. And then you probably remember this interest formula from your math days. It simply stands for, to get the interest amount, simply take your principal, how much you still owe, times your rate, times your time. And the time is always in years. So if I say you had three months, you would take three over 12 not just three, because three would be three years if you just put in three by itself. So you would do three divided by 12. When we get into the book exercises, it's actually gonna break it down even further. It's gonna go into days. So it'll say, um, we did this December one at the end of the year towards December one, and we need to make an adjusting entry. So there would be 31 days in December. So you would do 31 over and then the book says to use 360 as the number of days just for rounding reasons. It makes it a cleaner number. So we would use 30 or 31 days out of 360 and then multiply by the, um, the rate and the principal. You can go any way because it's a multiplication. It doesn't matter if you start back here and work this way. Um, so that's how we're going to get interest. We're going to do this at the end of every year especially if the note isn't paid off, because we're gonna show that we have earned money. We're gonna do an adjusting entry, similar to like how we do wages expense. We still show that wages have been worked. We just haven't paid them yet. Well, now it's just the opposite. We're gonna show that interest has been earned, but we just haven't received it yet. Okay, so we got an example here. We are a roofing company and we billed our customers $10,000 uh, April 1. And the customer, we allow them to pay us, uh, we allow them to give, to give them 12 months to pay us. And as long as they pay us by then, it's a 10% interest rate. So we're gonna see how this um, works as interest is being collected or, and or accrued. So our first entry is, pretty, is very straightforward. We just simply, this is a note because A, it's 
kind of a long amount of time. B, uh, it's a big dollar amount. Now those two by itself don't necessarily make it a note, but what um, what seals the deal here is that we have interest. So we're gonna debit our note receivable, which is just like an account receivable, still in the assets. And then we're gonna credit service revenue. Service revenue, just same revenue that we've always been using so far. So that's April 1. Now, when we come to the end of the year, we still haven't collected any money. We didn't expect to, but we have earned some money. We have loaned money for those uh, nine months, and therefore we should be able to show that we've earned some revenue out of that interest, even though we haven't collected it. So what we're gonna do is here is off to the side, we're gonna use our formula, the principal, what's still owed, 10 grand, times our rate, 10%, times the time. It's been nine months, if you calculate it out, if this was starting April 1, so we have the whole month of April, and then all the way through, you'll get to nine months when you count them out. And then when you do this, this um, in your calculator, you should come up with $750. And what we're gonna call that, we're just simply gonna call that interest receivable and we're gonna tack it on. So this would be note receivable dash say Joe, and this would be interest receivable dash Joe. Joe owes us two different amounts, the, the actual bill and now the bill's interest. You could, <clears throat> some companies may just put this all into one account, but the reason I didn't is I don't want this 10 grand change. This is the main principle. And if I put it in here, it may make me wanna make this now 10,750. And some companies like student loan interest, they calculate interest based on whatever your balance is right at that moment. So therefore they would just, they probably wouldn't even call it an interest receivable. They may just put it right into your note because your balance then, whatever you owe, they're gonna take that times the percentage times the time. They're just, you're gonna have interest on interest. This one, the company says, no, we're gonna allow you just to pay a, um, a flat interest on the, on the bare, bare minimum note. We're not gonna tack on the interest until later unless you don't pay us. So now it comes, so this is, this is, uh, notice I have a new interest revenue. I don't call it service revenue because it's just a different type. It's just showing where my revenue is coming in. That's all just for book purposes. It's still, everything else is the same. It still goes on the income statement. Now comes the beginning of next year in March 31 and payment is due. So when I come down to do the journal entry, what I wanna look at is how much is gonna be paid. So what, what, I'm, what I'm basically, this can be the last number that you fill in. You know you're gonna get cash, but you could initially put it as a question mark. And then you gotta think, what are all the sources of cash that are gonna come in? Well, the big source is gonna be the primary note. The customer's gonna pay you that 10 grand for the roofing job. Then the customer owes you 750 for last year's interest that you put onto his bill. Now that was last year's. Then the customer owes you 250 more for this year's interest. So in a sense, we just put, I, all I did for this one is just take this formula, and just change that, just change the months. It's still 10 grand that's owed, the, the basic note, times the 10%, but now the amount of interest is only three months because I've already